Alrighty, it looks like we are live. Looks like the audio and the visual are working. If not, go ahead and let me know. I'm George. I'm one of the founders of Solo Suit. We help people resolve debt lawsuits. This is our webinar on how to how to do that, how to resolve your debt lawsuit, also how to uh, file for bankruptcy if you're interested in doing that. We'll be talking about it. We have our friend John Skiba on the show with us today. Uh, he helps consumers. Uh, across the U.S., especially in Arizona, deal with uh, debt disputes and get them resolved, deal with debt generally, and especially help them file for bankruptcy. John, I'm going to let you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself some more. Great to have you on the show. Yeah, George, well, it's uh, great to, to finally do this. We've kind of been working in the same circles for a long time, and it's finally good to, to make this connection, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, yeah, so like you said, you know, I'm a, an attorney in the state of Arizona. I've been doing practicing law just past 20 years. <clears throat> it seems crazy that it's been two decades of doing this, but my practice is mostly focused on, I can tell you, I started off doing bankruptcy work and that's really all I did. And probably about 15 years ago, I, you know, I, I was running the clients all the time who were coming in, they were being sued by a, a creditor. And it was usually like a junk debt buyer, like a Midland funding portfolio recovery, one of those companies. And you know, they're like these relatively small lawsuits, three, four thousand dollars. And people are like, you know, I can't get my wages garnished. I need to I need to let's just do the bankruptcy. And I was like, man, I don't want to I don't want to throw you into a bankruptcy over a thirty five hundred dollar lawsuit. And so that's when I really started kind of digging into the whole debt buyer world, these debt collection lawsuits. And even as someone who had been practicing in bankruptcy for quite a while, it was kind of mind blowing to me just the, the scope of how many people were dealing with these issues and how big the debt buying industry was. And so that became a huge part of my law practice where I was in uh, to this day, that's about half of what I do. I do a lot of consumer bankruptcy work, but then I also defend consumers who are being sued by creditors with a pretty strong emphasis in uh, junk debt buyers. Like we mentioned, the, the various entities that file these, you know, volume, this huge volume of lawsuits. So, um, that's really kind of how I got into this. And then I started, you know, I used to be a blogger back, I don't know, maybe blogging still is cool, but I, I don't blog anymore, but started doing video and uh, started the Consumer Warrior YouTube channel, uh, which uh, I focus on kind of similar stuff that you do. And I know that's how our paths cross is we do a lot of the same types of things in helping people who are dealing with these types of lawsuits and um, just putting out a lot of video content uh, talking about this because I can tell you that what I have found over the years in my law practice is that the number one thing people need to do is just have a plan. And I realize that they have options. I, you know, I always say when people get served with a complaint and a summons, we always go to this worst place in our mind that we're all going to jail or, you know, and I'm like, if we take a step back, you can put a plan together. There are options. And when it comes to debt buyer lawsuits, there are even some good defenses out there that you can raise to these things to kind of get yourself back on track. So that's why I had done the channel. That's why I enjoy this type of law practice uh, is because you really need to give some hope of, look, there are there are things you can do here. And it levels the playing field a bit. I mean, I think that's part of what I'm, uh, the approach I take is, you know, kind of the underdog thing that a lot of these companies are gigantic and the resources they have to put into it are huge. And the most, I think I saw a statistic, and you may know this better than me, uh, the in debt collection lawsuits, I think it's like 98% are unrepresented. You know, there's very few people that have even access to not only lawyers, but, you know, things, whether a solo suit or, you know, even I've put together some little tutorials, just information they need to be able to, to represent themselves. So, so that's kind of my, my backstory, how I got into it why I'm doing what I'm doing now. That sounds great. That sounds great, John. Thanks for the overview. The uh, the burning questions in the in the chat are about your uh, your football background. You got the BYU helmet back there. Yeah. Can you tell us about yeah. that? Yeah. But in the uh, in, in my prior life, I, I played football, college football at BYU, uh, offensive lineman. I graduated in '99. Um, so if there's BYU football fans, I, I played under Lavelle Edwards, uh, which is, uh, you know, now the stadium's named after him and he's icon in coaching football. But, uh, so that was an awesome experience. Um, now I'm an old man just with, you know, uh, all the memories. Nice. <laughs> nice. Someone asked if you're a UA Wildcat as well. Did you, were you at UA at all? No? Uh, no, I, 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 I okay, didn't. Nice. I, 
Yeah, all good. Editors on. Nope. It's cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Fun fact: me and John went to the same university, BYU. So here we are. If you're, if you're any BYU folks in the in the uh, webinar, let us know. All right, all right, John. We're going to jump into uh, some questions. All right, folks. So we reserve most of the time here for Q and A. Uh, so get your questions into the chat. There's lots of people here on the webinar. So get your questions in there, and then we will uh, try to answer them. And as we get into this, you know, our, our standard disclaimer here is, uh, I'm not an I'm not an attorney. So this is not an attorney. We aren't your law firm. We aren't providing legal advice. This is just a a webinar. Uh, John is an attorney. However, again, he's not providing legal advice. This is not a, an attorney client relationship in any way. Right? We're just having a webinar here. All right. So uh, starting off at the top, we got Wolf. Hi, my wife and I live in Florida. We don't make much income. Did the means test and qualify? We have no real assets other than that my car, that is 2011 Volkswagen with no air or heat. The only asset is land in Colorado that is assessed at $8,000 and maybe would list at 35,000. Is there a way to keep the land? Maybe I declare and she does not. Title is in her name. I guess he's asking, so he's, it sounds like he's in Florida. He's asking if he can declare bankruptcy and somehow they can keep their land between him and his wife. Yeah, a uh, lot of lot of legal issues in there. Um, I, I can tell you, so bankruptcy is a federal statute. So it's generally, you know, similar from state to state. However, some of the issues that you're bringing up there um, are exemption issues, and those are state specific. And the idea behind the, the exemption laws is they protect your assets. So if you file a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, the big picture is it gets rid of all your debt, uh, at least your unsecured debt goes away, but then the court is, or the bankruptcy trustee is going to look to see if you have any assets that can be taken and sold with the money given to your creditors. Now, most things are exempt. So like most people have heard of like the homestead exemption that protects equity in your home. Uh, and if you're in Florida, I believe the homestead exemption is unlimited, which is still mind blowing to a lot of attorneys. <laughs> But there are also other exemptions for usually like cars and retirement accounts and your household goods. Um, the tricky thing there, and so kind of to our disclaimer at the beginning, I don't know all the exemption laws in every state. And this is why in a case like this where there are assets that you can lose. So like if you were in Arizona filing bankruptcy, the, <clears throat> the vacant land in Colorado would be a, a big deal. You'd lose it. No, no questions. It would be gone. Um, so you want to talk to someone in Florida and see if you can apply because some states have what's called like a wild card exemption, where you might be able to apply, a, a, you know, something to that land. Generally, vacant land in and of itself is not going to be exempt. Um, but there are, I know like California has an exemption where you can use a portion of your homestead exemption if you, if you're in it, like you have, if you have a lease or a rental. So that's something you're going to want to talk to someone local about for sure. Um, because in many circumstances, like the vacant land, uh, you're going to lose it. You're also bringing up a, an issue of, you know, as far as married couples. Now, married couples typically do not have to file together, but there are some community property states. I know Arizona is a community property state. I don't know if Florida is. I don't know um, off the top of my head. But in certain circumstances, even if both spouses are not filing, you typically have to disclose all marital assets. And that may be considered a marital asset. So that's what I'm saying. There's a few layers of legal issues there that for sure you're going to want to talk to an attorney. Um, I, I always recommend attorneys for bankruptcy, which I know is super self-serving in me. But that because of that, there are, you know, what's something that maybe on the outset looks like just a, uh, you know, pretty straightforward thing. You kind of start to dig back. And I've seen a lot of people jump into a bankruptcy in a situation like that. And all of a sudden they're losing this land that was super important to them. And uh so definitely I have that check out, but those are kind of some of the issues I see with what you're got right. going on there. Okay, great. Nice. All right, next question. Brock, have court tomorrow for two credit card lawsuits totaling 5K, same company. I make 400 to 500 a month doing DoorDash as I'm mostly a stay-at-home parent. I filed an answer for both, and I don't know what to expect in court tomorrow. So they got uh, these lawsuits. Go on the court tomorrow, which they expect. You know, it depends on if it's if it's a trial or if it's just like a hearing. Um, you know, the general flow in most states, you you know, there's the complaint, 
you've got to file the answer um, and get that submitted. And then sometimes the courts will set like a quick status conference or a pretrial conference. So you, you ought to find that out first, uh, what exactly is, because if it's trial, that's totally different than just a status conference or a pretrial conference, which is just going to be a five minute thing where the court really becomes aware of your case for the first time and gives you some dates. If it's a trial, then the plaintiff, the creditor is going to have to put on their evidence and be able to establish it. That's one thing I tell all you know consumers that are dealing with this, these things, particularly if you're self-represented, you've got to remember that the plaintiff or the creditor, they bear the burden of proof in the legal system. They have to prove their case. You don't have to disprove anything. And so if it is trial, they're going to come in and they're going to, um, they're going to have to put on their evidence, they're going to put on witnesses, provide documents. Something I recommend to everybody that's representing themselves in a court hearing is, I mean, your court's tomorrow, so you may not be able to do this, but it's to try to go down to the courthouse and just sit in the back and watch how the court handles things. You can talk to the clerk of the court ahead of time to say, hey, I have this kind of case. Is there one that I could come watch? These are all public proceedings. You can sit in the background. And even if your trial's tomorrow, go an hour early and sit in the back. I, I can tell you, I remember when I was a brand new lawyer, the first time I went to court with the, one of my, the attorney that was supervising me, I just sat there and I was like, wait a minute, I can do this. <laughs> this doesn't look that hard. And I think a lot of people, once you get in there and see, it's not as overwhelming uh, as, you, as, it, you know, as it might feel right now. But I would find out, first of all, exactly what it is tomorrow, because it might just be a, a status conference, pre-trial conference, and then you just need to make sure to be there. That's going to be the biggest thing, and the court's likely going to give you some dates. Nice. Okay. Uh, are, are hearings and trials the same thing? Are, the, are those terms used interchangeably? Kind of. Um, I mean, a, a try, I mean the, you can have a hearing on just a regular you know, a motion. Like if, almost all debt collection cases, the plaintiff will file a motion for summary judgment where they're basically saying, judge, we don't need trial. Just look at all of our documents and tell us if we win. Um, sometimes judges will have oral argument and you'll hear attorneys say that that's a hearing. You know, we're going to have a hearing on this or if there's a hearing on, you know, let's say you, uh, you know, consumers ask for some discovery and they haven't uh, received it from the creditor, the court may set a hearing to determine if they uh, are entitled to it. So I guess they are different. A trial is literally, you know, TV trial where there's witnesses and objections and evidence and a final ruling kind of thing. So I think that's kind of the biggest difference. Okay, cool. Great. All right, we got a question from Mrs. Peaches. Hello. First, let me start by saying there's a scammer amongst us uh, who uses, let's see, I'm not sure what that's getting at. He or she kept begging me to email them. I'm not sure what's going on there, Mrs. Peaches, but we don't want you to get scammed by anybody. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, my question is, I recently was granted motion for discovery uh, to... Portfolio Recovery Associates, I requested the original contract and purchase agreement. They provided an affidavit with the PRA employee as witness. Any advice on what to do next? So they provided the, the contract or they didn't? They, I uh, that. Let's see. So they're granted a motion for discovery. So it sounds like they're in discovery with the lawsuit against PRA. <clears throat> Uh, they requested the contract and the purchase agreement, and then I guess instead of providing those two documents, PRA provided an affidavit from an employee of PRA. Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, I can tell you, so it, 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 when you're dealing with a debt buying entity, there's going to be a purchase agreement between the debt buyer and the original creditor or the debt buyer and you know another debt buyer who they bought the debt from, from depending on how many times it's changed hands. Um, sometimes it's called a forward flow agreement. You'll see that. And so, I mean, one strategy is to request that because they don't provide it. The debt buyers don't want it out there. They, they'll always say, hey, there's proprietary information in there. Because it usually actually goes into their actual underlying contract, how much they paid for the debt. Uh, and it's not something they want out there. So you can request it. Um, they almost always object or they do something like that, where they just give you something that's non-responsive to really what you were requesting. You can file a motion to compel. In most jurisdictions, they require, you're going to have to look this up in your rules. I, I use Google Scholar, you know, something like that, but the rules of civil procedure, 
the, the rules are usually like rules like 33, 34, 36. If, if there's something where you're asking for it, and they're not providing it to you, um, you can file a motion to compel discovery, but you usually have to certify to the court that you reached out to them first and tried to resolve it informally. Um, I can tell you that usually, in my experience, at least here in the courts of Arizona, if if they don't, you know, because they always play games, they don't want to give it to you. If you go in, the courts are, because sometimes they'll say, oh, it's not relevant. Well, I'm like, of course it's relevant. It's the only, this is the document that gives you the power to be even in this courtroom uh, because you don't have a contract with the debt buyer. You know, there's no what we call privity between the parties. Um, and so they've got to have that document. So it's relevant. So I've seen the courts will almost always force them to turn it over. My little asterisk to all of this is I, I always say with discovery, I, I get the feeling of like, okay, I'm being sued by this creditor. Um, I'm going to force them to just provide me all this evidence. Um, I always say, eh, be careful a little bit because it kind of goes back to, um, you know, what I was saying earlier that they bear the burden of proof. If they show up to court and they don't have documents, if they don't have witnesses, if they don't have their evidence, they're going to lose without you even saying a word. Uh, I had this happen last week. I was in, even in Arizona Superior Court trial, so we're dealing with, you know, debts that are over 10 grand. The debt buyer showed up, they had no witnesses um, and they had very limited documentation. The court granted judgment and they ordered them to pay my client's attorney's fees. So I always say sometimes less is more. Um, so I, the, the, I, I have seen it where you, I've re, you know, people requested the forward flow agreement or the purchase agreement. If the court orders them to do it, I have seen debt buyers just drop the case. They would rather not have that out there and just say it's not worth it. Um, but um, sometimes there, if you request documents that they don't have, they'll actually go back and they'll buy it. They, they call it media. They purchase additional documentation from the original creditor. And now they have more evidence that they didn't have in the first place. So it's been a little counterintuitive. So I always say be a little bit careful with discovery um, because sometimes, like I said, less is more when it comes to what they're providing. Nice. Great. Okay. And, and an affidavit, uh, an affidavit in this case that they provided you is a statement. It's like a sworn statement from PRA saying that they have the documents that you're requesting basically, but they don't, or, or they have like a right to collect, but they don't actually have the documents. It's kind of what it sounds like. Right. Yeah. That, that shouldn't be enough. Right. Um, that shouldn't be enough. And it, it shouldn't, you can't, they can't use trials, those in trial either. I always object to those because I mean, it's, it's hearsay. It's, it's an out of court statement. It's a written statement, but it's still basically them saying, Hey, this is what this person said to us. So it's not That's enough. So you could, pre I think that this person could press them on that issue. Nice. Okay, great. Well, we got about 10 minutes left. A lot of questions to go. So let's, uh, I'm going to go into like a lightning round here on, uh, answering these guys. Uh, all right, we got. Ella, this is pretty much a question for SoloSuit here. Are you SoloSuit to respond to the lawsuit? They sent credit card statements as documentations of the of the debt. How do I respond next? I was searching for answers on the website. I wasn't sure how to move forward for success. So you have a few options once you've responded to the lawsuit. Uh, you, if you don't if you don't owe the debt, you can press through to a hearing and try to win at a hearing. Basically, show up and like John has pointed out. Your argument is that they can't prove you owe the debt because you don't owe the debt. If you feel like you do owe part of the debt, you can use our tool called Solo Settle. Uh, we recommend using Solo Settle Assist, and you can use that to get the lawsuit uh, fully settled. So you can use our software to get the thing settled. Uh, that's probably uh, that's like a best option for 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 most people that are coming to our site. If you want to declare bankruptcy, so like if you have a lot more debt compared to your income, then you might want to file for bankruptcy and you can talk to, you can go to John's YouTube videos or his website uh, to talk about that. If you're in Arizona, you can help you do that. Um, John, on that, is there like an income ratio? How do you determine if someone should file for bankruptcy or, or just fight a lawsuit? Is there like a debt to income ratio that you look at? How do you determine that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the first question I ask people is, would you be filing bankruptcy but for this lawsuit? You know, if, if the lawsuit, the debt collection lawsuit never shows up on your doorstep, were you even considering bankruptcy? And if the answer is no, then I would say, okay, well, let's fight the lawsuit then. Or, I mean, I always look at overall debt picture, you know, because it's, it's really, it's possible to, you know, win the, 
the battle and lose the war kind of thing. You know, if we win this lawsuit, we put all this effort into it, and we win it or we settle it out for something that's really low, are three more going to take its place in six months? And if that's the case, then maybe we got to start looking at a bankruptcy option. You know, I know there's sometimes where there's assets involved, kind of like that prior question. They have this piece of land that they don't want to lose. So bankruptcy is not something maybe where they want to be. Uh, so maybe we have to fight the lawsuit. But I always start with that first question. Were you kind of thinking about bankruptcy anyway, and then you got sued? If so, let's just let's just get the get the bankruptcy and deal with it all at once. Um, in the big scheme, if you're dealing with a lot of debt, it's going to be cheaper and more efficient and more just just yeah efficient to get everything dealt with. But if it's just kind of a one-off thing, or there's other non-bankruptcy things, then that's maybe where you got to start looking at contesting it or using the, the you know the settlement tools to to get it resolved. Okay, great. We got a question from Joy. When and where do we submit the motion to compel arbitration? This is pretty much a question for me. Uh, yeah, so you can use our site to generate a motion to compel arbitration that can trigger the arbitration clause in your credit card agreement. Uh, we don't file that document for you. You have to file it on your own. Uh, so you'll need to, you can look at the answer document that you created with us. You should file the motion to compel after filing an answer in our process. And you just file it with the same court that we filed the answer document for you. So you're going to send it into that court. You're going to send the copy to the attorney. Depending on the state, you might have to pay a fee to get that motion filed. Uh, but get that done. Uh, we got a question from Janelli. I was sent a request of admissions. Should I answer or just file a motion to compel arbitration? Is that question for me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so it sounds oh. like they were sued. They filed an answer. Then they got a request for admissions. What should they do next? Yeah, requests for admission are that that's a that's a that's a landmine. You got to be careful with those because the re, requests for admissions are so it's a discovery request where they send it over and it's kind of a check the box. It's going to say, "Hey, admit you owe us one thousand five hundred and sixty dollars, yes or no," um, and they want you to admit or deny whether you uh, you know to the various questions. The problem is in most jurisdictions, if you don't respond to those timely, they're deemed admitted. And so I've seen uh, law, law firms who will send those over knowing that, you know, the, the, the questions seem ridiculous on their face. And of course, we deny that this is what's owed or we deny that you own it. But if you don't respond to it, then it's considered uh, an admission and they'll attach it to a motion for summary judgment. So even if you're going to compel arbitration, you know, you kind of that, that's going to take a little while to get the court to grant that for you to get that started. You want to make sure you respond, particularly to requests for admissions timely, or that could really backfire on you. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Yeah, and if you want, and again, if you want to settle, I would recommend signing up with our civil settle settlement tool to get that taken care of. Uh, if you don't owe the debt, then like proceeding and trying trying to get to a hearing and winning is a, is a good path. Uh, Philip, I've already been sued by Cavalry, Cavalry SPV. They have contacted my employer to freeze my pay. Sounds like they're wondering what they should do next. So it sounds like they lost, they're now getting garnished. Yeah, so it sounds like, I mean, the, because there usually has to be a judgment in place uh, for them to do the, to get a garnishment. Once a garnishment's in place, your options are really limited um, because they, they all the leverage is for the, the creditor. So that's, I mean, usually that's when we look at a bankruptcy option. That's one of those issues out there that could lead to a bankruptcy because as soon as the bankruptcy, the, the petition is filed, the court enters an order that stops all collections, including garnishments. So you may end up looking at a, a, a bankruptcy. If not, I mean, sometimes they'll settle, but it's it's rough. I mean, you're going to have to pay 95% on a lump sum, in my experience, if they have a garnishment in place. Because the issue is they can tell you to pound sand and they're going to get a percentage of your paycheck, you know, going forward. So that you want to try to avoid the garnishment. Once it's there, it's really probably more of a bankruptcy type thing to get that stopped. Right. Okay. Yeah, good. Good to hear. That's a good option for bankruptcy. EJ, I have a bench trial hearing on the 19th next week and originally had requested copies of a ledger, chain of title, contract between plaintiff and defendant with wet signatures. Uh, sounds um, like they're just wondering what to do next, it sounds like. What, when's the trial? Like next, next week? week? Okay. Um, you know, if you've requested documents, I mean, and they haven't turned them over, I mean, that can be brought up. It's probably too late to, to make a huge issue out of it. Other than if they haven't, most jurisdictions have disclosure rules. You got to provide, you know, there's no trial by ambush kind of thing. And so if they haven't provided it to you at this point, 
they're not going to be able to use it against you either. And so that's one of those things to remember, hey, they've got to prove the case. They've got to prove the contract. They've got to prove they own it. If they don't have those documents, uh, it's going to be more difficult. So even though they didn't turn them over, that may be to your benefit. Okay, cool. Bruce, hello, can you tell? Uh, let's see. Once I win my appeal, reversed and remanded in Supreme Court, what is my next step? Sounds like maybe he actually had his appeal reversed, uh, or if he's asking if that will happen. Um, yeah, what, what, what are the chances of getting a appeal reversed, and then what do you do next? You know, appealing judgments, uh, a lot of it depends on really kind of how the trial went. And one thing that people often make the mistake is they think if they appeal it, that the Court of Appeals essentially retries the case, and they don't. Usually they're looking for what's called an abuse of discretion. They're looking to see, did the judge just totally screw something up? And I can tell you, I've had appellate courts tell me, look, I may not have ruled this way if I was the trial judge, but it's not so far outside the realm of what's appropriate that we're going to reverse it. So appeals are tricky and you probably need an attorney there. But if you won and they've remanded it, that means that they they usually send it back to the trial court with some instructions. So you might want to look and see exactly what they said, because sometimes they'll tell the judge, go back and retry this portion of it. or um, you know, if there's something, the, the remand usually means that there's some kind of specific instructions that they're giving the lower court with what they should do. And that's where you really need to look and see what, what they're telling the lower court to do at this point. Nice. That sounds great. I'm glad you're here, John. My, my knowledge on appeals is pretty much just from a John Grisham book about appealing about it. <laughs> hey, that's, that's enough. Sometimes that's enough. Nice. <laughs> Perfect. All right. We got day Z. Uh, is, when is the ideal required time to submit a request for arbitration if that clause exists during the complaint response or after? I mean, I have my opinions. I, I, George, you may have yours. I, I think it's fine to file it instead of the answer. I, I think the earlier, the better. Um, I have seen judges when it's filed. Uh, I, I know this from my own experience. Um, well, first of all, I should say, if you look in the arbitration clause in the contract, Sometimes there are limits to when it could be filed. And so you need to make sure that the sooner the better. Um, but I've had judges, even when those restrictions aren't there, where they'll say, hey, trial's in a month. We're not, we're, 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 you're committed. you know. And whether legally they're right or they're wrong, I think the sooner you can do it, the better. I even prefer to do it instead of the answer or shortly thereafter. Nice. Yeah, and that is a fine move most of the time. So for our... For our process, we recommend people do the answer first and then motion to compel arbitration because that works better in some states and because uh, it just as like a consumer, it covers your butt a little bit more. Yeah. I think with a lawyer, totally fine. Uh, I think most lawyers would do that, file a motion to compel arbitration before filing an answer. And you bring up a good point because... Because so if, if I file a motion to compel arbitration instead of an answer and the court denies it, they generally will give you, you know, 10 days to file the answer. Yeah. But if you file the answer first, then there's no risk of right. default. And so that's right. probably the safer road to go. Yep. You don't have to remember to file the answer once yeah. your motion gets denied or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. That's pretty much time. Let me see if I can just get a couple last questions in here. Uh What's the best attack plan against debt buyers like Midland? Yeah, so if you're being sued by Midland, just file an answer. You can use Solos to do that. And then we recommend you sign up with our Solo Settled tool to get that thing settled. Uh, Christina, I did a debt resolution. One of the accounts has refused settlement and only offered a balance in full after filing suit. Is there anything I can do? Um, yeah, if you're if you're in the lawsuit currently, you can try filing a motion to compel arbitration. If there's an arbitration clause, you can also just wait for the hearing to get closer. Uh, every day the trial gets closer, the likelihood of them settling will increase. Uh, Pamela, can you discuss what judgment proof means? John, I'm curious on your take on this real quick. My my take is that judgment proof is kind of like a false concept. Like you're only judgment proof if you're never going to make money or have assets again in your life. Yeah. Does that sound right to you? Yeah. I, I always tell people you got to be real careful 
you know, with that, you know, cause it, th there's very few people that I tell them, okay. You know, cause some people say, Oh, I just won't respond to it. I'll just ignore it because they can't take anything anyway. And that may be true right now. Like I know like in Arizona where I practice a civil judgment is good for 10 years and can be renewed every 10 years for the rest of your life. And not only that, it's usually, you know, turning interest that whole time. And so I, you know, I, I it's very rare where, you know, someone's got to have almost no assets and have no prospect of assets. They have to be on social security where it's totally exempt. But even then, I mean, the, the creditors, like, even though they may not be able to collect, they can still hound you and cause all kinds of grief. And, you know, I, I it, it's very rare where someone's truly completely judgment proof, at least, you know, for the long term. Right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Russell, I had a bench trial Monday and the judge issued a default judgment against me. I don't understand why. What do I, I filed an answer in court. I was at the hearing. I don't know what to do. Um, I mean, I, yeah, that, that does sound strange if you were there, why they would enter a default. Um, I mean, I've seen courts, they'll strike answers if, if you didn't do a, um, like a disclosure statement or something like that. It, it may be something, I mean, you could, you could request some clarification. You should look at what the appeal time frame is. Um, and then it's also, you, you have the option to do a motion to vacate the judgment. If, if there's something procedurally, but without more information, that one's kind of tough. Yeah, we feel for you, Russell. Hopefully you can figure something out there. Uh, Brian, my only income is Social Security. Can I still be sued for past credit card debt? Uh, short answer there, Brian, is yes. You can be sued anytime by anybody for anything, pretty much. Uh, the only way to defend yourself in a lawsuit is to respond, right? The judge won't stop the lawsuit from happening. Uh, so you got to respond. Can your income be garnished? Probably not, but sometimes it can. Uh, also, can I email the collection agency su suing me to request info? Uh, yeah, you're welcome to communicate with the collection agency to try to work towards a settlement or something like that. Uh, let's see. George, real quick, can I just bring up one point? Yeah. Something that, that that question brought up is sometimes I think, I you know, there, there's an impression of people that the court will kind of craft some kind of settlement agreement or work out some kind of payment plan. It's important to see the courts. It's they're kind of like the umpires. They just say liable or not. If you're going to settle the debt, you know, using a, like some of the tools that Solo Sue has to get that done, that's how that's going to happen. It's not going to happen because you go to the court and say, "Hey, my income is X. What what kind of payment plan?" The court's not going to get involved in that. Yeah. Right. All right. Last question here, Sean. Is there an advantage to the debt being handed through multiple parties? i.e. the more the better. I have a debt that was bought by a debt buyer and is now in the hands of yet a third. Yeah, so it's going to make it more difficult for them to prove that you owe the debt. The more times it's being sold, basically, they have to have good documentation of all that. Uh, as far as like settlement goes, we see that original creditors settle for about the same as debt buyers oftentimes. John, yeah, any the, final thoughts? The, 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 more, the more that it's been transferred, the better. Um, especially if you're going to actually litigate it, if you're going to take right. it to like a trial or deal with the summary judgment motion, if it's changed hands three or four times, those cases are procedurally and with their documents are usually a bigger mess. Um, and I tend to agree. I mean, debt buyers, some of them will go lower. The, the only original creditor that I see digs in their heels a bit is American Express. They, they seem to press us a little harder. That may be an Arizona thing. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to agree with you on that. All right, John, this has been awesome. Very glad to have you on the on the webinar. So glad you could make it. Uh, thanks, folks, for showing up. Uh, we do do these webinars about once a week. The schedule is a little bit more variable in the month of December because of the holidays. Uh, but if your question didn't get answered here, hopefully Hannah was able to get to it in the text or just keep your eyes open for the next uh, email for the next webinar. All right, thanks for showing up. John, thanks a lot.